Yes. Okay, we are recording for posterity. So it's September 12th, first lecture, second unit. We were going to start off, like Dr. Fogger mentioned, by making just another announcement that PPFs for the spring are due. Time to turn them in. September 15th, which I guess is going to be Friday. So those of you who know where you're going, go ahead and submit your PPFs. You, even if it's the same place, you have to submit a new one for spring of 18, NPN 686. So it has to be, you can't just repeat the one you just entered. It has to be for the semester and for the correct course number. Um, so time to start getting those in if you know where you're headed. The VanApp GE people, do not panic. You do not know what your assignment's going to be yet. We know that. Um, but those of you who know where you're going, time to get them in so they can get processed and finished and you can be anxiety-free because all that's done. Uh -huh. The folks who wanted uh, clinical sites at Children's, those will also be going in late, but because we've worked with children's people for a while, they the folks who are preceptors usually don't commit to be preceptors to closer to when the semester starts. So even though we could want your PPFs in by the 15th, um, the preceptors won't commit this early. So um, those folks who wanted to do clinicals at children's uh, will We'll get them in as we can get them. So uh, those are some of the realities that we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. As much as possible, it's important that you use the same sites that you used in the fall. Um, we really do not want people submitting new um, contracts for the spring or the summer. We should have gotten all the contracts for new uh, contracts in and done mostly because it's a very costly and expensive process and it's not a guarantee. So if you're secure in your clinical site, you like your preceptor, uh, the ideal thing would be to make sure that you've got a child site and a geriatric site, but as much as possible that you're working with the exact same people because they will be able to see your growth as a clinician. If you switch around a lot, they won't know you and they won't know what you're capable of. And we really want to help you become um, as strong as possible, which means that you need to have feedback from people who have worked with you and, and continue to work with you. So enough said. That's my commercial for the time being. I'm going to mute my mic and we'll just go ahead and get started. All right. Yeah, I, those are, that's a valid point about, the value of um, continuity with preceptors, if at all possible. So the department's ready to start accepting them September 5th, uh, 15th. If you know where you're going, send them in. Uh, so unit two, initial assessment. Y'all have been in clinicals. I guess this is starting your third week. Starting the, This is the third week of the term. So you've been in clinical maybe two weeks or so. Uh, anybody have a chance to see an intake? performed. Sabina did in Norman, Oklahoma. Excellent. I do intakes every day. This is Jennifer. Jennifer, all right, you do out the wazoo. Okay. Brenda got yes. to see one. Uh, Miss Smith saw zero. No in all caps. Uh, Miss Wadworth did two today. Jake has not. Right. And that's about typical. With, with outpatient psychiatry, those of you who are in pretty traditional outpatient settings, you only see someone for an initial visit one time, and then everything else is follow-up. So kind of proportionally, unless you're, I guess, doing the intake clinic function, you're probably going to see vast majority follow-up. So it's okay if you haven't seen one yet. Tonight, what we're going to talk about, partially because you have the intake note coming up due pretty soon, is talk about assessment in general and maybe some nuances of an initial intake assessment in an outpatient setting. The majority of this is applicable to a follow-up interview, which maybe by the end of the semester y'all will be doing some of. 
So hopefully some of this material can be applicable uh, when you're kind of working on your notes to turn those in, that intake note for this this weekend coming up. So first visit, stranger. You're a stranger, they're a stranger, they're walking in your office. That first visit's really an opportunity to get as much information as you possibly can, which is an impossible task to get this person's whole uh, whole history. How long, side note, on average, how many minutes of a session have y'all had? Those of you who've done an, uh, an initial initial visit intake, how long do those are those appointments for y'all usually? Hour, usually about an hour, fifty to sixty minutes. Yeah, some folks an hour is pretty standard for an intake. And Sabina saw one about 50 minutes. Sure. And, you know, depending on the complexity of the patient's history, it really depends if you can get a sufficient foundation in an hour. Some people I know do adult intakes in 30 minutes. I don't recommend that. I think an hour, getting that clock in your head that I have an hour to do an initial for this person, pretty good. I'm glad I'm glad that's the experience that y'all are having. Just some things to think about. Because the assessment, the initial assessment starts in the lobby. I don't know if y'all go to get your patients at my clinic. I go to the lobby and I call the patient so I can see them in the lobby. And you can start assessing, especially from a mental status observation objective standpoint, the person there. You can see, you know, how are they dressed? What is their affect just as they're sitting there? Are they sitting are they still? Are they calm? Are they fidgeting? Are they anxious? Are there indications of medication side effects? Um, is their affect appropriate? Are they looking around? Do they look anxious sitting with the back to the wall, staring at the door? Are they alone? Are they with someone? Are they interacting appropriately? It, it's pretty common for me that I'll do a, I'll have a session with a patient and they are very you know, they are somber, they are minimally conversant, they are very reserved, things are terrible and awful and, you know, negative, negative. But they go back out to, to schedule their follow-up appointment and they are chatty Kathy. You know, cute, big, appropriate range of affect and joking and chatting and, and this and that. And so you can you can get information when... Um, not necessarily sitting in the room with you. And this was at the VA. So these were, these were, you know, 30 year old, 40 year old, 50 year old. So people can be very different. So, so keep in mind that you're getting a snapshot of this person's behavior when they're sitting in a nurse practitioner's office for a mental health appointment. That may not be how they are the rest of the time. So, you know, take it out, take advantage of, of all the, all the opportunities. Same thing as if you have you know, comparables, if you have notes from another clinician that come in with them or a police report or an ER, the note from their, their stay in the ER overnight. So just grab as much information as you can, even just kind of looking at them when they're out in the lobby. I like to know if this is the person's first contact with the mental health provider. What difference do you think that would make, say somebody's walking into your clinic, if if this is the first time they've ever seen a shrink, how might that change things? Yeah, totally, Jennifer, exactly. They might be uncertain and anxious about how this is going to go. So, And that, that's also a pretty easy way to start off a conversation. And that's usually, and there's no right or wrong way to do this. You don't have to do this, but to say, um, you know, this is the first time I've gotten to meet you. Is this your first visit here with a mental health provider? It's just a, a, a simple way to start off the the conversation. And it lets me know if, no, I used to see somebody else here three years ago or my first time here, but I'm transferring care from somewhere else. Yeah, they may be more apprehensive, uncertain, and they don't know what you need to know. Patients, patients don't know what you need to know, so part of our job is to, to guide them to, because you know the information that you need to know, or at least eventually you will know. So like you're saying, the patient is probably thinking, what on earth am I doing here? I don't, I don't want to be here, or 
they're going to think I'm crazy or they're going to think I'm weird or I'm just, I just need to get my meds refilled. Can I get out of here as quick as I can? Um, and we, we do not need to know and because and it, it doesn't, doesn't really matter if anyone in here has ever seen a psychiatrist, a therapist, a counselor, grief counselor. But if you have, just kind of think to yourself, what was it like when you showed up for your first appointment with that person? That's the good chance that's how the patient is feeling too. Not super comfortable. Not sure what's coming. Just things to keep in mind. Uh, just housekeeping up front. Sessions tend to go better when they are structured at least somewhat up front. And some recommendations, and I think Carlet, Carlet is a very helpful textbook for this topic and for when you're writing your intake notes and for when you're trying to figure out what on earth am I supposed to be saying in these interviews. But to explain up front, hey, I'm so and so, you know, I'm Simone, I'm a, I'm a uh, psychiatric nurse practitioner here at the VA, and this is your first visit, so. We have about an hour. We've got a lot of information that we're going to try to get, so I'll be asking a lot of questions. Some of them won't be applicable to you, but I still have to ask them. Um, so we'll just get through as much as we can. So you would say your name and what you do when you're here working with a preceptor and the amount of time you have at your clinic and what the purpose, what you're trying to get at. It may come up in the beginning. Because sometimes patients will ask you, now who can look at my record? And who can you talk to about this? And so that, that introduces privacy. The patient's right for this information to be his or hers alone. And confidentiality, the situations in which we are obligated to release that information. So keep Keep in mind, you want to go in prepared, if a patient is to ask you this question, about how you would answer if someone asked you, so who can get at my record? Now, now who do you have to tell about this visit? Has anybody, I know y'all been, we all have been in practice in, in mental health for a long, long time. Do y'all deal with this a lot? And if so, how do you handle that question from a patient? Now, who can see my record? How do y'all handle that? Maybe you haven't had that experience. Oh my, we've just, I just, <laughs> I just got a bolus. I just got a bolus of responses. Jennifer said, y'all talking about that this morning. Patient wanted to see their medical records. You see at the VA, a patient can log in and read every single thing that's ever been written about them. Um, privacy is protected by federal law unless it's kept confidential and left, unless it's not. There's a way to present this to the patients to where they realize that the maintenance of their record, whether it's kept confidential or released, is really for their benefit. And, and yeah, say, nobody can look at this. I can't tell anybody anything that you have said to me today unless it's an issue of safety. That if I'm concerned about you keeping yourself safe or concerned about the safety of someone else, then I have to get other people involved. Uh, but other than that, whatever you say in here stays in here. Right. Because if it gets to be an issue of there's a subpoena for the record, there's going to be so much time and red tape in there. Bleh, that is not going to be your decision to make. I don't get to decide, you know. Mm -mm. But if a patient plans on knocking somebody off or they can't guarantee that they can keep themselves safe for 24 hours, then sure, that's when this comes up. So just no patients may ask, what, what you going to do with this information? One patient said she stabbed someone, and we struggled with that one. Huh. Stabbed someone. Interesting. And, you know, I am not informed enough to know if there is 
Hmm. We have duty to protect vulnerable people. Have duty to protect uh, to prevent a suspected attack on someone, even if they're not vulnerable. Huh? Yeah, I would. I would have to. I'd have to talk to my supervisor and the the legal department and the and the ethics department because I really don't know. Call the police and do a welfare check. Right, that's really the issue is if you, I mean, shoot, if you stab them once, you might stab them again. I have reason to believe that person's at risk. Uh, sure, and then, but, and then you get into the whole patient permission thing, and that's where I don't know about if they're, if they're currently not planning on threatening somebody. You know, I really don't know. We can't force competent adults to file, you know, police reports. Uh, that is complicated. I would have to seek advice from legal aid from my, the company I work for. All right, thank you for that complicated example, <laughs> Ms. Wood. Uh, so moving on to the interview, and this this kind of goes more toward your intake note identifying information. This is like the kind of like the wristband, I guess, sort of, of your patients, that it would be a very quick way to identify if you're talking about the right person. Age, sex, marital status, uh, can include occupation, can include referral source. For an intake especially, the referral source is helpful. 40-year-old um, married, African-American male, well known to this clinic, being treated for major depressive disorder. If it's a follow-up note, and that's how the ID section will differ between a follow-up and an intake, is the patient is already being treated for blah blah diagnosis. If they're known to you, then sure, they, you're treating them for something. However, in this instance, like for an initial intake, 40-year-old African-American male, seen for an initial visit, referred by his primary care physician. The value of the referral source of an initial note that informs um, kind of the patient's role in the access to care. Self-referred, it was the patient's idea. Referred by the patient's primary care. So the patient didn't necessarily identify this issue. Someone else screened and caught it and referred. Referred by DHR. Referred by drug court referred by employer. So you can see how knowing essentially whose idea this was, that that informs um, kind of the patient's stance, position, involvement in accessing care today. On your notes, we'd also like to know insurance. Uh, in the ID section, if the patient is being seen with a parent, a sibling, a spouse, you would go ahead and add that there as well because that is identifying the source of the information from, from the interview. And again, as we go, y'all, any questions, please just say, hey, and we'll stop and we'll, we'll go over it. This is pretty straightforward at this point. Chief complaint. Mm -hmm. What you here for? Add some more little bullets so we can talk a bit more. There we go. The chief complaint. On your notes, that's going to be in quotes. It should be in the patient's own words. A sentence. A phrase. A couple sentences. This isn't real long. This isn't a book. But this is the patient's declaration of the reason for the visit today. Right off the bat, it can be really helpful to just give the patients roughly three, four, five minutes to just talk about what's bringing them in. And don't interrupt. Um, you can reflect and you can kind of paraphrase and make sure you're picking up on accurately what they're trying to communicate. But just letting them talk for 
a few minutes at the beginning can be invaluable. How do y'all, if you were to give an example of how might you invite the patient to do that? Just one or two folks. What might you say? Or what have you seen your preceptors do? What brings you in? Mm -hmm. Easy peasy. Yeah, what brings you in today? You might get a little smart alecky comment about my wife <laughs> or my boss or yeah, mm -hmm. which still is informative of uh, how excited they are to be there and their awareness of probably the reason why they're there. But that's that's perfect. Very simple. So what what brings you in? Very simple. And what, what that will reveal to you, like we said a little bit ago, is the patient's own understanding of the issue. The patient's, what does the patient think is the problem? I'm having problems at work. I'm getting in, I'm getting in arguments at work and my boss is really coming down on me. That if I don't check this, another warning and I'm gone. Okay. I can't sleep. I feel angry all the time. During those three or four minutes, or however long the patient wants to talk, because again, they may not be real forthcoming. They may be really forthcoming. They may not be real forthcoming. So we will have to do some of those minimal encouragers and, and kind of open-ended questions, helping them explore different different themes that come through, which is really what you're what you're listening for. What can I help you with today? Uh, this is a, another really good example. This is just anything to invite kind of a, a view into their world and what brings them in to a mental health appointment, which most people are not comfortable going to and are not looking forward to going to. So something has driven them to be here. And what you're listening for, in addition to their view of the problem, is you know you can hear, oh, there's a pattern of conflict with other people. There's, um, I'm hearing some mood symptoms. I'm hearing sleep and energy. I'm hearing loss of interest. People will say, I just, I just don't want to do. I mean, I used to be really excited about fishing. I just don't care about that anymore. I just don't want to go out with my family anymore. I. Just sit, I'm just worried about stuff all the time, and I can't unwind, and I can't sleep. You'll hear anxiety. You'll hear mood. You'll hear psychosis. You may hear um, like a, you know, some personality features, relationship conflict, maybe not taking tons of responsibility for things. You can tell how much insight they have. You can tell, do they think about what they think about, how insightful or introspective, kind of how psychologically minded are they. You can get a kind of a grasp of vocabulary, emotional vocabulary. Do they talk about feelings? Do they not talk about any kind of feelings, any kind of emotion? The level of reasoning, simple, abstract. What you pick up on in those first few minutes, you're coming up with hypotheses. It's like a funnel. You have this really broad view, really just tons of hypotheses. And then your, your mission for the rest of the visit is to test those hypotheses as best you can to come up with um, with a diagnosis, Dr. Fogger's mentioning, what have you done to deal with the problem so far? Right, if, which is a good point. If the patient identifies sleeping as an issue or anger as an issue or anxiety as an issue, um, what, and we're about to get into old carts is about to make an appearance, a cameo. So we'll talk about what makes it better, what makes it worse. Sabina's mentioning, you saw patients whose affect was incongruent 
with what they were talking about, smiling while talking about SI. So what did you do with that? Or what did your preceptor do with that observation? She she ended up asking a lot more. Uh, uh, she delved deeper into what they were saying, you know, and and really wanted them to expound on their their feelings and what was going on in their lives even though a, a few of them were kind of minimizing, you know, the suicidal ideation and, and just almost joking about it at times. So, but she didn't let it go. She really pursued it. Mm -hmm. And she really emphasized their safety. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. I mean, we, I can only help someone who is alive. So if, if I'm concerned that they are considering alternatives to living, then that becomes a priority because we can't help people who aren't with us. So, so yeah, investigating that certainly. And I think if I remember right, Wheeler, Wheeler talks about immediacy in chapter four about, I don't know if she calls it techniques or com therapeutic communication or how exactly she words it, but to just to point out the discrepancy of someone talking about suicidal ideation with a smile would make you wonder to kind of hit pause and say, you know, it, it, I, I just have to comment. You're talking about dying and you're kind of, you, you're joking a little bit about it. Help me understand what, what that's about because that is an unusual, so probably they're uncomfortable or, um, and that's just how they're handling it. But it's perfectly appropriate to just call it what it is and say, whoa, when there's a discrepancy between what they're talking about and their affect. Um, then you can get you can get people to kind of drop those defenses because you're you're calling the. You're calling the crap, essentially, and, and addressing that that discrepancy. Which might seem like getting off topic because they're not just talking you know, talking more about whatever it is, but the issue is that the disconnect there is really the biggest issue. It needs to be talked at, and you can talk about that up front. Chief complaint has been determined. So you have your your hypothesis about what's going on, say it's anxiety, say I think this is a, I think, I'm kind of thinking this guy is depression, I'm kind of thinking this lady is having signs of a trauma related disorder. The next step is to rule in and rule out your, your findings and also to see if there is anything else. Those investigating questions, asking about so you mentioned you're, you're angry a lot at work. Tell me about the, the situation that has happened to you recently and have the patient describe it. What led up to it? Um, what were the triggering factors? How did it resolve? Are there other situations in which this presents? Because anger isn't necessarily, anger is not necessarily a symptom of anything. It's certain, anger is certainly not a DSM-5 uh, diagnosis, but it can be a symptom of mood disorders, um, substance use disorders, behavioral disorders, personality disorders. So you need to get more information. You need to rule in, rule out some stuff. When did it start? How long have you been having this anger issue where you just want to blow up on people at work? When did it start? How long has it been going on? And I know y'all are really good at, at saying, well, what changed around that time? Can you think of anything that was different before then? Like a loss or a change, an injury, an illness. Was substance use co-concurrent uh, with the onset of these symptoms? That's really important. You're trying to establish a timeline. For an initial visit, and here's where it gets really, really a, a little more complicated for an initial visit versus a follow-up is you're trying to get a snapshot of their symptom picture today 
we'll just we can use depression as an example because that's really simple. Someone comes in, can't sleep, and uh, lost 10 pounds or so in the last you know, not a ton of weight, but maybe 10 pounds in the last month. Just don't really care to eat. Withdrawn some. Insert depressive symptoms. When did this start? When did this episode start? Did anything precede it? Has it been pretty consistent? Has it been this bad? Let's say it's been going on for three months. Has it been about this bad for the last three months or has it fluctuated some? Does anything seem, does anything seem to make it better? Like exercise, like time with family, like anything. Does anything seem to make it worse? The old carts, reappearance. So you have a three month history of XYZ depressive symptoms. But what do we know about depression? Is it a once a one time thing or what's some things we know about depression? That it might be a one time thing or it might be a repeat offender. Exactly. You have recurrent depression, yes. Exactly. It recurs. That's why in the diagnostic criteria of depression, you have major depressive disorder and then you have specifiers, which may be single episode. If this is the first time this person's ever met criteria for major depressive uh, episode, or if, yeah, you know, this happened to me when I was in my 20s, I was in college and kind of I dropped classes and my grades weren't so good and I stayed in bed a lot and I didn't I quit exercising I just didn't enjoy it anymore so that would be that that's important to ask because with many of these disorders mood psychosis um, I mean substance anything is possible but for an intake you need to get the picture right now you're also trying to get historical their course of illness because with depression, you could have had a previous depressive episode. With mania or hypomania, you could have previously had a depressive, more likely, or previous mood episodes. They're cyclical, and that, that has treatment implications, so that's why you ask those questions. Um, really, something I encourage you all to do very much, and you may or may not see this, your HPI, like I said, is a snapshot of current level of functioning. And that means what symptoms are relevant right now, but also the severity of the symptoms. And there's different ways to get at that information, but a really helpful way to do that is to quantify as many things as you can. So think about when you're in when you're in your clinicals, do you get quantities of information? I have trouble sleeping. You could document endorses trouble sleeping, but you want to know from a quality standpoint, is it trouble falling asleep? Is it trouble staying asleep? But how many hours a night are you getting? If you smushed all the little chunks together, how many hours are you getting? If the patient's having nightmares, how many a week does it, is it every night that you have them? If a patient is, if they experience panic attacks, how many panic attacks a week are they having? How many meals a day are they eating? Um, substance use. How many? How often? And that might seem, I don't know, that might seem like too much. That might seem like too much detail. But that is your indication of severity. And another way to get at this is, is, screening instruments or, or, or measurement instruments, which we'll talk about in a second. But you're trying to demonstrate in a paragraph, a snapshot of how this person's doing in hours of sleep, numbers of nightmares, numbers of panic attacks. That, that indicates severity, which lets you track the next time you see them. Are they sleeping more? Are they having panic less? Critically important in your HPI to to document quantities like that. And you'll probably read notes where the person says, oh, I'm sleeping. The clinician documents sleeping fair. Mood is fair. 
occasional nightmares, panic episodes rarely. Sure, okay, that might be true, but I have no idea what any of that means. <laughs> you know, as, as a as a clinician who may come up and follow this patient and someone who needs to evaluate the effectiveness of treatment at the next visit, if that's the information I have for my baseline, it's going to be really hard for me to know if the treatment's working or not. So take the extra time and get quantities for anything that you can think of. Patients also really appreciate when you can say, oh, well, you know, a couple of months ago, you were having nightmares boy, every night. And today you're saying you had two this last week. When patients can hear, oh, I really am getting better because you tracked how they were doing last time. That is that is such a that is such a gift to give these folks because they may not be aware that they're doing better. And that gives them encouragement and confidence to keep in treatment. So please do this. So that's you get your current symptom picture. When it's the initial visit, you are additionally charged with the responsibility to see what has ever been the case. Have you ever? Um, so have you, say you you go through your question and you come up with, oh, I'm pretty sure this person has a, is having a depressive episode, major depressive episode, right in the second. You want to know if they've ever had it before. What disorders off the top of your head, what what can be comorbid with major depressive disorder? What do you think? Sure, from a medical standpoint, right? Hypothyroidism, vitamin deficiencies, anemia, anxiety. There you go. Exactly. Anxiety disorders, substance use disorders, trauma-related disorders can all be comorbid. Um, kind of like panic can be uh, comorbid with OCD, kind of like ADHD is often comorbid with anxiety or ODD. When you get a, a bead on what the deal is today, that puts you on high alert for other things. So while they may deny any anxiety today, you want to know, well, have you ever? So I recommend, you don't have to do it this way, you can ask your preceptors, ask your clinical instructors, that in your HPI at the bottom, you, you go into sort of a, a psychiatric review of symptoms because you can, you can tell me that this person is having a major depressive episode today. That doesn't mean they don't also meet criteria for alcohol use disorder for generalized anxiety disorder. The only way I know is if you ask them and they deny it. So your note and your interview should include questions about panic, generalized anxiety, hypomania, in our case, substance, OCD, psychosis. And the way that you do that really simply is you ask the patient about the primary feature of those disorders like we have right here and that's criterion A in the DSM meaning you can't have the disorder if you don't have criterion A makes it really easy to rule things out so just kind of memorize or jot down if you have a template you take into appointments just jot down criterion A of panic bipolar 2 bipolar 1 OCD y'all may kind of be familiar with these already based on on your work but um, this will this will save you a lot of time and in an initial intake you can ask uh, so do you describe yourself we'll do GAD do you describe yourself usually as a worrier or do things kind of roll off your back and if they say no I mean, I'm pretty easy going I don't I don't get you know I might worry about bills sometimes but it's not all the time so that's not what people with generalized anxiety disorder say so I can say, all right, don't make criteria for GAD now because they don't have the primary feature. And then you can say, well, have you ever have you ever been more of a worrier that it really bothered you and you couldn't control it? That goes back historically. So you can say denies ever experiencing 
uncontrollable worry, the primary feature of, of GAD, or denies current or prior uncontrollable worry. Denies current or prior um, panic episodes. Denies ever meeting criteria for hypomania. Denies any history of intrusive images or performing rituals. So there's ways to uh, denies ever feeling uh, watched or persecuted, denies AHVH, positive symptoms of schizophrenia. Right, so it's just a really, you have five word, five, listen to me, five sentences, and you've ruled out and documented that this person doesn't report ever having a history of those things. It just lets you rule out what isn't relevant. So you can focus your treatment plan and any subsequent provider can look at your note and say, this is the deal and it, nothing else. We asked about it. Nothing else is the deal. What is and is not relevant. The only way that I know the person doesn't is that it's documented. You can remember mem uh, these little mnemonics. You can memorize, dig fast. You can memorize Siggy caps, however you want to do it. Memorize the criteria for the disorders. Some people like Siggy caps and swear by it, and that's fantastic. Whatever makes sense to you. You can have yourself a little PHQ-9 sitting right there, and that's all the nine criteria of a major depressive episode, which is the primary feature of major depressive disorder. Screening instruments, like we said, the Beck Anxiety, the GAD-7, um, the Yale uh, Obsessive Compulsive Score, um, the Young Mania Rating Scale. If you're talking to somebody who maybe they don't, they don't really want to answer your questions. I had somebody like that recently who she said, I'm really getting tired of these questions. I said, I hear that. I've asked a lot of questions. Would you be willing to fill out this paper for me? <laughs> And she didn't mind filling out the form. She was just tired of me talking to her. So have some have some backup plans. you got to be flexible sometimes. But if it's someone who's not real forthcoming, they don't want to talk, they're not really giving you definitive answers about things, you can give some screening instruments. And if they score really high, well, that points you in the direction of what this might be. Like their Beck anxieties, 10 their PHQs 20. Well, okay. So this, according to this, I should be maybe looking more depression than not. Is uh, This relates to what we were just talking about. The psychiatric review of symptoms or review of systems, however you care to look at it. It's just like when you're doing a physical, uh, a medical review of systems. You ask about dizziness, blurred vision, um, cough, cold, congestion, chest pain, palpitations, shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, stomach pain. You're asking all these things just so you can rule them out. And the only way you're going to rule it out is if you ask. Same thing in an intake, especially and even with your follow-up visits as well, is if you don't ask about these things, you don't know. So I encourage you to ask about substance every time. For an initial visit, you want to ask everything because you don't know, and you're trying to get as much information as you can because, like I always say, the, the effectiveness of your treatment depends on how appropriate it is to the diagnosis you come up with. And the diagnosis you come up with is entirely dependent upon the information that you obtain. So in your hour or your 50 minutes, ask, because unless you ask, you don't know. Um, kind of like in those, in those case studies that we just, uh, that we just had in 685, Unless you figure out the the fellow with the weight gain on the Seroquel, 
you may have been tempted to, oh, we'll change the Seroquel right quick, but and you don't know that the Seroquel is the culprit unless you assess and rule out behavioral dietary causes, other medical conditions, other medications he may be taking. Has he been on steroids for some reason for uh, a skin condition or for um, has he just had a sinus infection he can't get rid of so he went to a doc in the box and they just have him on steroids for months. So the, what you decided to do for that patient may not have been appropriate depending on the things that you ruled in and ruled out. And uh, Dr. Fogger's mentioning you may have to keep the patient on track. Sure, some folks don't want to talk, some folks want to talk a lot. And they don't know what you need to know. So ask about comorbidities, rule them out. And again, any questions you'll have, shout them out. We're going to go until, we're going to go about 10 minutes, 10 more minutes. This is the, the chunkiest part of this, and we're going to finish the rest of this PowerPoint next time, so we'll just get as far as we can this evening. Uh, and of course, history of suicide, history of trauma, and... Depending on where you want to do the trauma assessment, a lot of times it's, for me at least, it is most um, compatible, I guess, during the social history assessment, uh, social or family, when you're talking about like lifespan things, because trauma can happen to people at any point in their lives. Um, Obviously, if the person is endorsing symptoms consistent with a trauma-related disorder, then you would have up front assessed for trauma, uh, be it accidental, like a MVC, be it work-related, be it uh, physical, be it sexual, be it current or historical. So sometimes it, it comes to the fore, the trauma history has to be assessed early, and other times it may not be, but you'll have different opportunities to bring it up in the rest of the interview. Safety, 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 current suicidal ideation, history of ever attempted is a big deal. Family members ever complete a suicide attempt, and of course you would also assess the lethality of the attempt, the conditions around it. Um, because that makes you really flag this person knowing that safety concerns will be a big, a big part, uh, down the road. Past psychiatric history really should be psychiatric care history is a better way to look at it. It's really short. And in the template we have posted for the intake, it's, you know, five or six things. Have they ever seen a provider for their anxiety, depression, anger, substance? Are they coming to you from, from another provider? Are they currently taking medications for their depression? This is where you ask ideally any medicines they've ever taken for depression and ideally you ask well what was it and what was the dose how long were you taking it did it help did you have any side effects why did you stop it ideally that's a lot of questions right and very rarely do patients know but it matters if they took, oh, I've done Celexa and Prozac and Zoloft and Effexor and Cymbalta and Vibrid and I've done all those medicines and I, cause, and I took them all for a week and it didn't do a thing. It just made my stomach hurt. So they've actually not had any medication <laughs> trials. So get getting as much information as you can that they can give you and, and don't be surprised if, if it's limited. Have they ever required inpatient hospitalization 
Have they ever been severe enough, acute enough that they require that? Again, prior suicide attempts. Have they ever hurt themselves to feel better? Cut themselves, burn themselves in order to feel better? You may encounter certain patients who have a tendency, a lifelong history of self-injury for emotion regulation purposes. Um, you would want to assess risk factors for suicide, which we'll talk about this pretty regularly as we go. But the risk factors for suicide are things like depression, things like not sleeping, a prior attempt, current intent, current access to means, the, the medically ill, divorced white male living in the country, That's kind of the cliched one, but it, it continues to be accurate um, for veterans, younger veterans in their 30s and 40s, post-deployment, not sleeping, increase in irritability, kind of a external shows of aggression is a concern, and substance use. Because anything that, as Dr. Fogger says, anything that aids impulsivity is a risk factor. So someone who is, and if you work at the VA, you ask about substance every visit. And for a suicide assessment, you ask about, are you currently using? Because anything that increases impulsivity increases the risk. So that's why you certainly want to ask about those factors. And guns are lethal and difficult to intervene, so that's why we particularly are interested in firearms. Or if the person has a previous attempt, whatever that, whatever that means was. When you're talking about their care history, it's also appropriate to say, well, what has ever helped you? Oh, grief counseling, therapy. I took Selexa 10 years ago, and it was really helpful, but... I didn't think I needed it anymore, so I stopped it. I was doing better when I was working. I was doing better when I had hobbies. I was doing better when I was spending time with friends. We'll do this next slide, and then we will lock and load right exercising. And what's interesting is when you're talking to somebody and they say, oh, I'm just so depressed, I feel awful. And, well, tell me about a time when you felt better, a time in your life when you were doing better. Oh, well, I was, was probably three years ago. I was working. I was in a relationship. I was exercising more. I was going to church. I was... um you know, painting pottery in my basement, whatever it is. Because what happens is if people would add those components back to their lives, it would be beneficial. It's not just that, oh, I get depressed, I quit doing these things that are good for me. When you quit doing things that are good for you, well, isolating when you aren't caring for yourself and staying engaged and active and connected to people and supportive activities in your life, well, of course you get depressed. So that behavioral activation part, we will talk about more as we go. Family history, so we talked about psychiatric treatment history. Genograms, if you have the time, and I think we have a link to an example of one, the little circles and squares to show mom, dad, brother, sister, maternal and paternal, grandpa, uh, grandma and grandpa. That's helpful in identifying interpersonal issues, 
in the family, which may expose you to how the patient learned, no coping skills, emotional volatility, abuse, neglect, those kinds of patterns. Trauma, exactly. Uh, adverse childhood experiences or adult experiences. Who was in the home growing up? Were you raised you know, by both, both bio parents, mom, dad, brother, sister? No, but then there was a divorce when I was 10 and I never saw so-and-so anymore and it was really bad and money was tight. Kind of family history. Genograms are just quick little pictures of, of all of that. When you're asking about mom, dad, brother, sister, which is how I word it, um, have they ever been treated for anxiety? Have they ever, or depression, have they ever seen a therapist or a psychiatrist? Did they ever have to go in the hospital for nerves or for anxiety or for depression? And have they ever taken any medicine for anything? And that's helpful, as y'all know, with kind of ruling in, ruling out treatment options. That if if my if my identical twin sister has anxiety and she takes Zoloft, then that'll probably be where I start, you know, with the patient. Of course, that's an oversimplification. You can also, and this is sort of the way to get. Uh, now we have genetics testing to determine receptor responsiveness to medications and, and um, metabolism and things. But in the absence of that, you can ask family history because that, that gives you a better indication. You're just trying to rule things in and rule things out. And if mom and grandma and sister all have panic disorder, and I don't really know if this is a, a panic issue or a mood issue. Well, I'm going to lean more toward panic. Again, family uh, family history of suicide because one of the there are some factors that have to be in place for someone to complete a suicide, and fear of pain or fear of death is a factor that needs to be resolved theoretically before suicide is complete. So having a family member complete a suicide may reduce that person's um, aversion, for lack of a better word, to it because it's part of the family culture. It may also make the person just horrified by suicide. I'd never do that. You know, They'll say, I saw what it did to my family. I would never do that. But that's why we ask. I worked with a patient who her mother was one of ten, grew up in probably the 30s or 40s. The, the patient's mother was very, she was maybe, it doesn't really matter, an older lady. Parent was, mom was one of ten, had eight, uh, eight siblings, and they all committed suicide. I found that initially very hard to believe because um, it's just shocking. So if you have a, a family history almost unbelievably significant for suicide, you can also suspect and significant for substance use and significant for a mood disorder. But that's why we ask. Support system resources, some of what you're trying to get in that intake in addition to everything that's bad and wrong, is what's good and helpful. So, it, also because that's protective against suicide and, and will be supportive in their in their treatment is, if you have a problem, who would you go to? Who in your life do you trust? And who in your life do you know um, would look out for you if you needed something? Who can you rely on right now while you're working through this? So you also want to get an idea of the good stuff, the supportive stuff, the supportive people. Um, strengths, right, absolutely. A lot of what we do is encouragement and, and helping people remember that 
there are positives in their lives and that they have they have some things going for them too instilling hope believing in them those kinds of things but more specifically this evening we've talked about a few different histories the HPI is the biggest chunk look through Carlet Carlet explains just goes into more detail about that, what to include, kind of how to word it when you're working on your, your intake notes for this weekend, how to word it. The goal is to be thorough but efficient. Even an HPI on an intake, on an initial note, shouldn't be more than, oh, I don't know, 12, 14 lines. It, it should be no, no more than a half of a page. Ideally, more like a fourth to a third of a page, but that's with a lot of practice to include what you need, quantifying things, ruling in. Does your HPI justify the diagnosis that you're gonna you're gonna claim at the end? And just just having oh the patient reports depression for the last two weeks that. That is not sufficient to then down the road say, oh, I'm diagnosing them with a single episode of major depression. Mm -mm 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 -mm. I should see five or six symptoms of depression endorsed in that HPI with when it started, quantities. Did it ever happen? Is this the first time this has ever happened? And I should also see that they deny the primary features of panic, GAD, hypomania, mania psychosis, so on, so on, so that anybody could look at your HPI and arrive at the same conclusion where you did. So it might seem like, oh my gosh, how am I going to do that? And how am I going to do that in a fourth of a page? You absolutely can. Just do the best that you can. And you will get tons of feedback from us about how to be thorough but efficient. So that is all we have for tonight, ladies and gentlemen. We will pick up next week with the remainder of this PowerPoint. So we'll pick up at, at uh, social history, continuation of family history. You're already talking about family, so why not talk about social history? Any questions, pronto, stato, before we shut it down? The exam two study template will be accessible. Um, at the end of this week. And you are more than welcome. Any questions, please, please, please email us um, and we will get on it. So thanks There's for hanging out tonight. Yeah. So one more thing in every Reminder again about the PPFs. Um, Ms. Duran is going to be approving the PPFs this go round and the usual protocol for um, if you have any questions, first ask your clinical instructor um, before you go to Ms. Duran about your PPF questions. Sounds That's all I wanted to say. Like a plan. <laughs> <laughs>